Hello there, welcome back to video number four, in which we're going to be learning about the scale of evolution. Now, we're going to be talking about macroevolution in particular in another lecture or series of videos as part of this course. So here, we're going to explore the links between small scale and large scale evolution and look at how those changes may or may not in interact with each other. So let's jump right in. So I wanted to first have a quick reminder of the link between the genotype of an organism and its phenotype. So the genotype or genomes are made of DNA. So that's shown on the left hand side here. DNA encodes for RNA, that's converted to proteins. Proteins then interact and then ultimately that ends up with the development of traits, morphological um, characters that we can see in organisms that interact with the environment. And it's those traits which are selected upon. Hence, we could say that genotype defines phenotype, and then it does so, so through the development of an organism. This relationship, I think, between genotype and phenotype is important when considering scales of evolution. So let's start with the smallest scale. And let's start by looking at changes in genotype. We've already highlighted that mutation is the origin of novelty. Let's unpack that a bit. In our genomes, there are individual genes, and these genes are things that code for proteins. And a mutation is a mistake that occurs during replication or through DNA damage. So some examples of different forms of mutation that affect just a single base pair are shown on the left hand side here. But bear in mind that there are, there's a whole world of study about how mutations occur. And these are not the only kinds of mutations. As an example though, it's estimated that spontaneous DNA damage occurs 10,000 times every day in every one of your cells. Radiation, such as x-rays and UV, can all lead to such changes, and these are sometimes called induced mutations. And errors can occur during replication and during DNA repair. That's just a few of the mechanisms from a broad range which can change DNA. The important thing though really to take from this is that when a change in DNA occurs, a mutation, that can lead to changes in a gene, and thus the genetic information of the organism but also that filters through to the phenotype. Even a small change can have big consequences when put through this filter of development. So a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP is the simplest form of DNA variation amongst individuals. That's a single change to a single base pair as shown on the left hand side here. For example, um, sickle cell disease is caused by a single nucleotide polymorphism changing one DNA pair in the beta globin gene on chromosome 11 of humans. So uh, that mutation then causes a change in the shape of the red blood cells in the person that has that mutation. So that's a direct result of a mutation. So mutations in genotype can ultimately cause changes to phenotype. Those of you that did my first year um, workshop Evolution 101 have definitely been taught this, but just so we're on the same page. In order to understand how that impacts other things, we can think about fitness um, of an organism as the no average number of offspring left by an individual relative to the population. I've put an, uh, a definition of this on the slide. I used an example of lizards in that workshop where the colouring of these individuals improves fitness, so it changes their fecundity, that's the number of offspring they have, in different ways, so either through warning coloration or through camouflage for different, different um, mechanisms of improving fitness. The changes that we talked about in the last slide can be neutral, they can be deleterious, so that's bad for the organism, or they can be beneficial, so that's good for the organism. Being beneficial is the rarest of these outcomes, we think. 
But bear in mind that the impact of mutations is often complex, and of course may change within may change with changes in environment and through time or space. So, as an example, while sickle cell disease causes misshapen blood cells, and that is problematic, it can lead to anemia, it can lead to painful episodes, and a range of other um, not very pleasant symptoms, the changes in these blood shape, cell shapes also protects against malaria. So there's a beneficial um, aspect to that mutation in areas where malaria is very common, especially. So as such, the changes <coughs> um, to a genome on a small scale are really rather complex, and there's lots of research happening to try and understand um, their impact. But we can also think beyond the individual when it comes to fitness. An individual's behaviour and its traits can sometimes help close relatives to it reproduce. This allows, allows us to think about, if we wish, personal fitness as separate from a thing that we can call inclusive fitness. So inclusive fitness is the adaptive value of an individual taking account not only of that individual's own success, but also the success of all of its kin. Okay, This is often considered alongside something that's called kin selection. So kin selection is a form of natural selection in which the altruism of an individual benefits its close relatives. And so this is the idea that there are strategies and behaviours out there that support reprodu the reproductive success of not just an individual, but also sometimes its relatives, even at the expense of an individual's own fecundity. A very famous example of this are the eusocial insects. An example is shown in the form of these ants on the left-hand side here. These are the different castes, that kind of means the levels of organisation of an ant colony. Um, so in an ant colony there will be a reproducing individual, the queen, um, but typically then there are a series of castes from workers through to um, those responsible for defence, which are actually sterile, they're not able to produce their own young. But through the queen, and sometimes male um, drones, ants, um, this entire colony is able to share its genetic heritage, and thus we think um, eusociality has evolved. An example closer to home is the sibling cooperation that we see in groups of lions. This occurs when siblings, closely related individuals, form a pair, typically. You can see um, proportions here um, in one particular area of India of the size of these groups. Um, a, these, these siblings form pairs or larger groups um, that work together. And if that cooperation leads to better success for either you or your sibling, it means that your own genes are likely to be passed on. So this idea of inclusive fitness is often considered when thinking about genes in particular. If we view a gene as an important unit of evolution, some people do and some people don't, then inclusive fitness helps us explain altruism in a way that proponents of the view that genes are very, very important suggest that a focus on organisms as a whole can't do. Which of those viewpoints, gene-centred or organism-centred, um, is closer to reality remains a topic of really active discussion. It's one of the, the very interesting topics that's out there in evolution today. If we move further beyond individuals, it's often useful to think about populations when we consider evolution. So we can think about, for example, the variation in age trait value. That's what we're showing on the top um, graph here. And then if we think about the survival of the individuals with this trait value, as shown in the middle graph, we can start to differentiate different forms of selection based on the interaction of these two graphs. So if we have something called directional selection, this is when selection favours either an increase or a decrease in the mean, rate, mean of a trait, as shown by the difference between the top and the bottom panel here. Fewer of the organisms with the small values of this trait survive, therefore, um, <coughs> through survival, the mean of that value moves towards the right. Make sense, I think? <laughs>
An example of this is shown here. This is um, based on a severe drought that hit the Galapagos Islands in 1977 that produced a very strong directional selection on the bills of the Galapagos finch. One of these is shown here. Bill depth, which is the distance from the top to bottom of the bill at its base, has a strong effect on the size of the seeds that these finches are able to eat. And as you can see from this graph here showing the survival rate, as a function of bill depth, there was a very strong directional selection for deeper bills during this 1977 drought. The middle um, graph here shows bill depth distribution before this event, so you can see that here. And the bottom one here shows the same um, measurements in the 90 individuals that survived the drought. So population went down massively, but in those that survived, the mean um, build depth had changed. So there was this change in mean. And that's an example in action of directional selection that must have been linked to the food choices of individuals with different um, size beaks in this drought. In contrast to directional selection, which we just met, there's such a thing as stabilizing selection. This favors individuals that are near the population mean and reduces a trait's phenotypic variance, we would say. So here in this um, <clears throat> example, survival outside of the mean would be um, less frequent than if you are very, very close to the mean. We think this is probably a very common form of selection because the means of many traits are likely to be the, near the values that provide the highest fitness. Um, in real empirical populations. Birth weight in humans is used as a classic example of stabilizing selection, as shown in this graph here. Infants with birth weights much smaller or much larger than the average have a lower probability of surviving 28 days. I chose this picture just because I really liked it. It's by Gustav Dore. Um, and so that leads to um, selection that keeps a baby's weight within the range that we typically associate with a newborn baby in humans. So that's some examples of selection, which we've talked about now um, for a few minutes. But some scientists' views align more closely with Christian Slater, as shown on the right-hand side here. I'm um, thinking about these things rather um, as chaotic, rather than selection being a particularly strong force. So it kind of makes sense if you think about it, that if there is no selection, let's just ignore selection for, for, for a moment, gene frequencies will just change in a population randomly. Um, and this is also true if a gene frequency has no impact on the phenotype. So if um, uh, you know a particular change in a gene has no impact whatsoever, we would expect it to behave chaotically. And this is what's shown in the simulations on the left-hand side. These different lines show frequencies of particular genes modeled within a population. They vary randomly, and sometimes they approach a point where all members of a population have a particular gene. So this blue line here is a, is a good example. That gene has, has gone extinct in the population. Okay. With smaller populations, as shown in the bottom right here, you get lots of fluctuations. And sometimes one gene comes to dominate, as I've mentioned, due to random chance. And that's far more obvious in small populations. If we compare gene frequencies in, in small populations with those in large populations, um, genes tend to have far more stability as random shifts are less likely to spread throughout an entire large population. This fact, the population sizes of many organisms, coupled with the idea that maybe neutral um, mutations are the most common, has led, in part, to the theory of neutral evolution. So I define this here. It's a theory proposed in the 1960s and others that most evolutionary changes at the molecular level are due to the random processes of genetic drift acting on mutations rather than natural selection. So this is the idea that at the genetic level, when we're looking at DNA, evolution is mostly neutral, and selection relatively rarely kicks in. So I've kind of highlighted that this, this view exists on the molecular level, but bear in mind that this also has knock-on effects. So if a population goes through a bottleneck, and we've seen that in small populations, fluctuations in, in genes are far more likely based on random chance, 
Following the expansion, so a bottleneck is just a small number of individuals that could then expand afterwards, we will expect reduced diversity in the genome. That can have significant implications. For example, the, the paper that I've put here from 2004 shows that hatching failure within birds is significantly greater among both native and introduced bird species that have passed through a bottleneck of smaller than 150 individuals. That is exemplified by the kakapo that's shown here. This is a, a bird that's endemic to New Zealand, which has been through such a bottleneck and has a high hatching failure rate. That's really important to know. Such research informs conservation. So in this case, when we're trying to found new populations of a species for conservation purposes, this gives us a strong steer as to the size of the translocated population, the population we dump in a new area that is required for success. If it's smaller than 150 individuals, this will be causing us a bottleneck, which will be increasing the failure of hatching in the, um, the, in the transposed, sorry, translocated population. So I think that's um, a really um, important thing to consider. So those are some kind of considerations that go from the molecular through to the individual to above the individual level. Then we can think about what happens in populations as these changes that we've met through selection occur over time. So we can add a deep time perspective to our view of these kinds of evolution. And it's sometimes useful to think about um, kind of things as lineages. This is an example we're going to look into in a bit more detail in, in the last video of this series of video that's based on the morphology of forams, which we already met in, um, in one of the previous videos. And this shows their change through time from a study that I'll explain in full in that last video. But we can see here a change in a population that's categorized in two ways. First, we see a period of anagenesis. I've defined this for you here, and that's evolution or evolutionary change along a single unbranching lineage, okay? So this is a way a lineage, uh, a series of, um, of kind of um, a population that has continuous through time changes as it reacts to, for example, environmental change. Then in this example, we see an event at 37 million years ago here, which we would call a cladogenic event or an example of cladogenesis. So cladogenesis is the development of a new clade by the splitting of a single lineage into two distinct lineages that are taxonomically different. We will look at defining species and how um, cladogenesis may occur in the next video. And the extent of change that occurs in deep time through anagenesis versus through cladogenesis is really hard to die down. It's a, it's a matter of a very active debate and it probably switches throughout time periods and across the tree of life. But it's a really interesting question, I think, to ask. With all that we have covered there, you can see that there are lots of different scales of individuals from DNA to genes to populations to species. We may wish to put these into compartments to help us better understand. On a small scale, we may consider changes within a population, mutation, migration, drift, and natural selection, something which we call microevolution. That's something to do with within species variation. And we could say then that that leads to anagenetic change. We may then consider changes above the species level um, as macroevolution. Those could include things that we're going to cover in our macroevolution macro videos, including adaptive radiations, rates of diversification, mass extinctions, and more. So though that, those topics all have their own set of videos that you can find elsewhere. But be aware that people argue over the relative importance of the forces that I've just talked about in terms of evolution. So exactly how important you think these two categories may be is completely open to debate. Furthermore, some people, some scientists think that macroevolution is just a logical extension of microevolutionary changes. But other people make a case that actually these are two fundamentally different processes. I wanted to highlight that that difference of opinion exists, but I'm not going to unpack it any further for you today. Um, but we will talk about it a bit more when we're going over macroevolution in other videos. I wanted to quickly finish today by just highlighting that 
we could ask, as a result of all of this, whether there are limits to evolution. The answer is yes. As we've already seen in our examples of poor design, um, limits exist. These are quite varied, and some attempts have been made to codify them. One example that I put on this slide is the idea of um, morphodynamics that was um, uh, an idea that was driven by a gentleman called Sylaka. Um, and this is an idea that places certain constraints on the corners of a tetrahedron, uh, tetrahedron, sorry, I should say, which all interact as a lineage evolve. You can see this in a diagram on the left-hand side here. In order to illustrate these, I'm going to be using this example of uh, a thing that we think may have reached a limit, which is an arthropleurid. This is a fossil of a giant millipede-like creature um, from about, about 315 million years ago. That was This fossil itself is about 75 centimetres long. The entire animal is about three metres long. So it's a good example of what we may think about the limits of evolution. So these constraints in morphodynamics include historical or phylogenetic constraints. These kind of constraints say that morphology has to be something that you can adapt from previous relatives. So in the case of our arthroploid, this is made up of repeating segments, because all of its close relatives are made up of repeating segments, as indeed are all arthropods. And thus, this provided a limitation on what was possible within this organism. You also get functional constraints. If you fly, for example, there is a maximum size you can achieve and still be able to fly. In the case of our arthroploid, um, there could be um, functional constraints about the strength of its uh, um, exoskeleton. So, for example, whether it um, could support itself on land or whether it was able to get enough food. There are also developmental constraints. So the genes of an organism define the ways it develops. And for instance, um, what you make your body from is limited by your development, and so there will be material limits to that. So again, in the case of this arthroploid, if its exoskeleton <clears throat> was not able to support it, um, that could have forced a hard size limit based on its development. And all of that is impacted by the environment in which an organism lives and how that changes through time. So the arthroploid died out when its environment, the environment it was living in, got much drier. So that obviously caused a problem for it. So with that, that brings us to the end of the video. And in our next video, we're going to be looking at species. So I'll see you there very shortly.